Hey everyone, this is Kit Cabell with Hard Lens Media, and look, I believe that we should have a true parliamentary system. I say this time and time again because guess what? I'm going to be talking to a third-party candidate, and it's important that we hear from different perspectives. I don't believe in a two-party system. I think the Democratic uh, and Republican parties are too intertwined. They're too owned by corporate lobby groups, and uh, basically they don't represent us. Now, of course, my dream of a parliamentary system, yeah, the Democrats and Republicans, you could be part of it too, but we got to break that system. And today, joining us again, that's right, because we interviewed him, I believe, nine months ago, Steve Cox, who's uh, running for a congressional district in the state of California. Steve Cox, thank you so much for joining Hard Lens Media. There's a lot to talk about. More subjects are now coming up with this horrible pandemic that we are in. Uh, this in madness that's happening in uh, uh, Minneapolis right now where we're seeing truly the police state even arresting uh, reporters and so much more. So, Steve Cox, le uh, I would like to uh, reintroduce you to our audience. So, for our viewers and subscribers, can you please tell us a little bit about yourself and the district that you're running in the state of California? Uh, yeah, uh, my name is Steve Cox. I am an independent. Kit covered a lot of that. The, um, the fact is, is that, uh, you know, I really and truly believe, I've come to believe... Uh, analyzing the system and starting to understand how it wor works. <laughs> uh, I really believe that uh, it's not a matter of can independents or third party candidates win. It's actually a matter of that we must. I, we absolutely have to because um, the same organizations, whatever, control both of the main parties almost entirely. Like if you said entirely, that would be close enough to accurate, you know. All right. So, um, anyway, so that, that's what I'm doing. I'm, I'm running in the 39th district. I, I'm out for this year because of the primary was in March. But, uh, you know, that, that was my second time running. Um, I got eight, over 8,000 votes on 500 bucks. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, but this time we have a system in place, and that's kind of a big deal for us is that we're building a system now um, in the campaign where we're going to actually be able to raise money, but we're also going to use it, use what we learn in this um, you know, put it to use the system that we've created. We're putting it to use in the next campaign in 2022. Right. And then afterward, we're going to release a handbook that's going to help everybody um, across the country run as independents, specifically as independents to learn, help them learn how to, to, to file the paperwork, how, you know, how to do messaging, how to, how, you know, all the different services that you can use that, you know, and all this other stuff, basically take the mystery out of running for Congress so we can start replacing some of these uh, corrupt people there. Right, because I do want to definitely talk to you about what you learned uh, during your congressional run in the 39th district in the state of California. Because yeah. a lot of our viewers, one of our viewers asked, you know, what district did you run in? That's the 39th congressional district that you were running in. Yes, sir. So I think it's important that, and here I'm going to kind of be the person that's going to ask the tough questions. Be, I'm going to be the bad guy here for Dude, one second. Uh, uh, oh. Every every politician should be able to answer tough questions on the fly. All right. Uh, I, I don't I don't shrug away from it. Go for it. So, Whatever you want. So so here's the thing. I know I have my bias about supporting third parties, but I'm just gonna be basically parroting some corporate media talking points. So sure. uh, why should people uh, be excited for third party candidates? I mean they, they don't make any impact. They're they're not really gaining any ground. And Lisa quoting Jenk Uger on Twitter, he's saying, Well, uh, you're choosing to pretend to be brave or you're being uh, you know, uh, re really uh, arrogant by thinking that you're going to vote third party when in fact you should fall in line so why should people even consider voting third party when in fact uh, you know maybe we should vote blue no matter who uh well Cenk is the best the best example because um in the 25th district he ran this year um he got less than 1,000 more votes than i did <laughs> and he spent he spent over five hundred thousand dollars i spent five hundred dollars so <laughs> The, the, the irony of having him say that stuff on Twitter, I'm just sitting here like, what? Come, really? Really? You know, come on. The, yeah. the, the reality is, is that uh, over 40% of the public is independent now, you know, but looking at, at um, Pew Research polls and things like that, um, there are more independents than either party. And, and actually, for the first time in a long time, last I saw was in March, um, the Pew Research polls showed that the, uh, there are more Republicans than Democrats. Um, so uh, the bottom line is, is if it, our government is supposed to work as a representative of the people, it's supposed to be by, for, and of the people. Mm -hmm. It hasn't been that in, in probably my entire lifetime. I'm 43 years old. Um, so if we actually going to talk about that, we're going to talk about our democracy and all, all these other high fluid things, um, we got to actually have one. And 
the only way that we can actually show that we have one, to be honest with you, is to kick these parties out because neither of them represents us in the first place. All right, well, but then hold on. I'm going to basically be parroting Jake again because, again, his tweet really uh, – well, to say it pissed me off is an understatement because oh, too, I, I don't man. I don't like being basically told that uh, I'm pretending to be brave when you know he lost yeah. in his own district as well horribly might I add but I think it's important yeah, yeah. that we that, 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 five hundred twelve thousand dollars five hundred twelve thousand dollars well hey big money doesn't always win right oh <laughs> <laughs> so so uh, the yeah. thing is though like we, 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 you would hear this uh, especially from Jenk, who has a larger platform of course uh he would say well uh the, the stakes are too high and uh, you know voting third party at, at at any race right now be it even at the, uh, the presidential race or even a congressional race yeah. it's 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 too risky because we need the democrats to beat trump um yeah. Our third party can our third parties, be they green, libertarian, socialist, non-affiliate, are they really truly the spoiler that ruins elections? Uh, absolutely not. But, um, it's the only way to legitimize a democracy I- at all. Um, you know, they're talking about, for example, and I'll, I'll come right back to this. But just to give you an example, they're talking about uh, mail-in ballots and making national mail-in ballots. But like the problem is when you're talking about mail-in ballots, you, you get rid of exit polls. If you don't have exit polls. You can't tell. You have no way to judge the results against, you know, anything to tell if it's accurate or not, right? So essentially, it ends up in a system where we have to trust that the government is just going to do what's right and count all the votes, and we'll just get the people that we're supposed to have. It's the dumbest thing. Don't trust the government. Like the government should be completely transparent on everything, you know, as much as possible. Um, so where I'm going with this is that you have. You know, all this system is in place, always telling us that we have to do this, we have to do that, we have to trust, we have to trust the parties, we have to, we have to beat Trump. The media is always pushing that we have to beat Trump. Thing, you know what? Trump is a symptom. He is not the problem. Trump is a symptom. He mm-hmm. is the oligarchy that that has been running this place for the longest time. He is the the very elite upper class, and now all of a sudden, with him and Bloomberg and Steyer and all these other people. We're actually getting people who who are deciding, you know what? Let's cut out the middleman. Let's just go ahead and get into, get, be, you know, and, and obviously Trump, but get into the presidency ourselves, and then we could just do, you know, serve our own interests from there. Okay. You know, um, as long as those parties are working for moneyed interests and not for us, it doesn't matter which one's in control. It doesn't matter. Right. So I think there's also another uh, thing I want to bring up, too. Now, you are going to run again in 2022, and uh, we do invite you to come back onto our show when that happens, because I believe in giving a voice to third party candidates. But my question to you is, in in a hypothetical scenario where you win as an independent, you have declared yourself as non-affiliate, correct? Uh, Yes. Okay, so the thing is, as an independent, how do you, as an individual not associated with the two-party system, help build and maintain power and also give that to other people who identify as independents? How do we really make sure that eventually we do have a viable third party or independent uh, options that basically won't be co-opted by the Democrats or Republicans? Because independents have a long, sad history, and third parties have a sad history in this country of being co-opted. You have the Green New Deal started by the Green Party, taken by the Democrats. Democrats, and then, of course, in 2010, you had the Libertarians, or at least the Tea Party Republicans, saying that they were That's Libertarian, right. even though they were never for LGBTQ rights or the legalization of any drugs at all. Third parties or always get, get absorbed. Yeah, so, 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 so the thing is, how do you build and maintain power and also make sure that, that that leads to a larger movement so that we can get to a true multi-party parliamentary system? Okay, so the basis of everything I believe in essentially is is that I believe in people. I believe in, in that, that when people are presented with a with choices, they're presented with information um, that they will make the right choices. All right, uh, all things being equal, and obviously we have a lot of propaganda to fight against and everything else. Um, but I have to believe in people because if you're going again, if you're going to have a country or a government that's run by and for and of the people. Um, you have to believe in the people. If you don't believe in the people's ability to make good choices, then, uh, you know, there's no point in trying to uh, fix this democracy at all, you know, which is really where I'm aiming to try and actually fix the democracy, not just get in there and push a policy here or there. But because the reason why I'm actually doing the uh, handbook thing for 2022, we're going to put it to the test then, is, is exactly that. I know that I can't get in there. And I won't have, I mean, when I get in there, I won't have any power to do anything. And I know that. 
Um, so it's not just about me getting in. It's about opening the floodgates so that we can all start getting in. A lot of people across the country can start kicking both the parties out. And when they do, and we get enough of it, I mean, it, I think it'll only take 12 or 12 or 20 somewhere in there of us getting in there that we'll, we will start to matter as votes. Like the, they're going to need us um, to pass certain legislation. And at that point, um, you know, and plus we start taking these seats away, they're going to start losing donor money because the, the donors are going to be like, why are we giving you guys all this money? And you just keep losing to these uh, ragtag group of independents and whatever <laughs> that are just out there, you know, taking these seats. So um, the end goal for me is to build enough of a coalition of other independents, specifically independents, mm -hmm. in Congress so that uh, we can we can actually control, uh, you know, legislation and prevent certain things from passing or, or make other things pass that, that we agree needs to get done. And then um, one of those two parties, probably the Democrats, but hell, I don't know, maybe not. Um, one of those two parties is either going to have to change and start to represent actual people instead of businesses if they want to stay in power mm. or they go extinct. And I'm good with either one. Um, I think at this point, a lot of people are really asking for a second party because both the Democrats and Republicans are owned by, by two major corporations. But at least according to corporate media or someone like Jenk Uger, there's a difference because the vote blue, no matter who people will, are saying for about for Biden, uh, yeah, he could boil a baby or assault a member of my family and I'd still vote for him because we got to beat Trump. But I think it's important that we do switch things up and start talking about like your campaign as well as yeah. uh, some of the current issues that we are dealing with because you are going to be running again in 2022 and I'm very, very yeah. curious to see what did you, what was some of the biggest uh, advantages that you, that you learned? Uh, what did you take away from your first attempt of basically running for Congress in a 39th uh, California congressional district? Well, the very first time it was this huge thing. There was like 18 of us in the race. And um, I think I got 0.6% uh, of the vote. Mm -hmm. um, and I, it was like 900 votes or something like that in the primary. And I spent more money too. <laughs> but you, you start to learn. You know, I learned a lot that time. Um, and then this time I learned a, a lot more. Um, and that's kind of the process for me is I, you know, I was a motocross racer growing up, so I was used to lo losing. I didn't win my first race in motocross doing it almost every weekend. It, it took me like three years before I won anything. So, um, you know, I know what it's like to actually just keep trying and keep pushing through and, you know, take the disappointment and, and everything of losing and, and apply it to the next one. And, um, but, uh, the biggest thing, honestly, that I, that gives me hope, um, is that as an independent, I have found that I can talk to literally anybody in the district, anybody. I knock on anybody. I don't, I don't take like a walking list. Like most candidates, they'll take a list of houses that they know are friendly, you know, cause they're the same party or whatever. And they'll knock on the door and talk to the person be like, hi, I'm, you know, so-and-so and I'm running for blah, blah, blah. And the people are nice because the, you know, you're, you're, you're on their team. Right. But I'm an independent and I, I don't, I don't, I couldn't afford to buy the list. I could afford to use PDI, which is a service to actually get the good list of all this stuff. So I was just like, well, I'm just going to knock on doors or try and find people who are outside, right? Like just in their garage or whatever. And just be like, hey, how's it going? And I'm an introvert, so I hate doing that. I absolutely hate it. But um, the thing is, is every time I knock on a door, every single time, with, with a very, very small number of uh, exceptions, um, mm -hmm. the person, I would say, hi, I'm Steve Cox. I'm running for Congress. Um, and they would fold their arms like this, and they'd go, which party? And I would go, well, I'm an independent. And they go, oh, okay. Uh, so what do you think about this? Or what do you think about that? Like they totally, it totally disarms them no matter where they are on the political spectrum. And there was one point in the 2018 race that I actually got the support of uh, an illegal immigrant in, in my old neighborhood where I grew up, an illegal immigrant who uh, got amnesty on a Ronald Reagan. Um, and Caddy corner across the street, a Trump supporter who had like the flag in his yard and a light on it and a big Trump thing, a big pickup truck and all that stuff. Caddy corner across the street. And I had my sign in both of their front yards. Wow. OK, well, that's that's pretty interesting because that's a good segue because uh, actually one of my good colleagues, John, who's a co-host and also right now moderating the live stream chat. He does have a couple of questions and I do want to at least focus yeah. on one of them. And it's a perfect segue into this one. In the Fruit Basket interview, uh, you talked about how you weren't very concerned with immigration. You said it usually works itself out. Can you care to elaborate? This is a question for my good colleague, John. Yeah, uh, yeah. they were saying that if we have uh, like the position um, on on there was that he said that if, if we have 
sort of an open immigration system that uh, having things like universal health care and things like that could become too burdensome, burdensome and you know cost too much money that these people be taken advantage of. Um, but my point was is that what causes the people to show up at our southern border, those particular illegal immigrants, because most of them are actually like flying in and overstaying visas and stuff, but um, the, the, the ones that, that we think of as immig illegal immigrant, immigrants, because that's how the media pushes it, or the, the Hispanic you know, type people from south of the border, those people are mostly showing up at our border because either we, we interfered in their government, our government did, and, and sanctioned them, did whatever, caused strife in their government, so made things dangerous there, so they're leaving, or a combination of um, our war on drugs, which creates drug cartels in the south, you know, in the in Mexico and South, um, that that because we're their primary market for these illicit drugs. So and those drug cartels make it very difficult for the people and very dangerous for people to live in those countries and and often completely run the governments. Um, and they if it wasn't for our prohibition of drugs, um, those cartels wouldn't exist because it's due to prohibition that those cartels are able to to you know smuggle drugs, sell them here in the black market, make all this money. And then go and, and dominate those countries. So, what I'm saying is, is that oh, and also in 2008 during that financial financial crash, I think like two million of the illegal immigrants that were already here left. Um, so, like the the amount of jobs or whatever sort of it, it found its own level, if you will, and, and mm -hmm. some of them uh, left anyway. So, um, I just don't think that that's the right way to look at things. I think that the the right way to look at things is to consider that all people, um, no matter where they're born, what language they speak, what religion they are. All people are essentially the same at the base because that's what a human being is and that they want the same things that we want. And so uh, to try, I think a lot of this comes from trying to, you know, prejudices that cause you to think that a certain type of person is bad or, or anything like that. And it's just not a, it's not a concept I could, I can buy into at all. So if, if people from any other culture want to come here and live and they want to be a part of our society and, and contribute, and I don't mean contribute economically necessarily, I just mean contribute as, as members of our society, as neighbors and, and everything else, come mm -hmm. on. Like I, I, want, I want good people in my country and I think most people are good. So yeah. it's not that complicated. I, I believe in the notion that the world is filled with good people. In fact, the majority of the world is filled with good people. It's just yeah. right now we have a whole bunch of sick sociopaths running our governments yeah. all across the world. So I want to ask you one more question from John, and then I want to focus on some of the current issues that we are dealing with, and I want to get your perspective yeah. on them immediately. So uh, this one question, I think a lot of our viewers would kind of like this because uh, we're, we're all getting, kind of getting sick and tired of Congress and its hypocritical actions. Uh, do you kinda, see things like... Starting. Do you, do you see things like your proposal to only pay congressional representatives the medium wage as an incentive to bolster the economy of their district? Uh, do you believe uh, in getting uh, lobbying money out of politics? Uh, yes, as much as absolutely possible. That, that's going to require um, a, a you know constitutional amendment to overturn Citizens United. So I'm not sure. You know, that's one of those things. Like as long as that's another reason actually. As long as these two parties are actually empowered, that's not going to happen. It's right. just not going to happen because they benefit from that ruling. They get all that money that runs their think tanks and their, you know, their all their BS. You know, the near attendants of the world. They make all their money from from uh, uh, you know health insurance companies and all this stuff, donating money into the party and 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 whatever. So um, that's another part of that. But yeah, we we a big part of it though, I think, and what I'm I'm starting to really believe. It's not easy running for office. It's, it's very, very difficult, actually, especially if you're not in a party because you don't have any of the support and everything else. That's part of what I'm trying to help with for everybody else that's going to come after me. But um, I, I sort of lost my train of thought that no, that's okay. We need to have we need to have enough people. We need to have enough people in there that are willing to fight. And if you go out into your into your community and you tell them who you are and you talk to people and you say, this is who I am, this is what I stand for, even if they disagree with you a lot of the time, they will, they will respect you, right? And I think a lot of the times they still vote for you. I can't prove that I, that where I got my votes from. I know which counties, but I don't know who, right, specifically. But, um, you know, I think that a lot of the public, maybe even most of the public, would vote for somebody they don't necessarily agree with that they know is honest. Um, before they vote for people that, that they they 
don't believe that they think are maybe if they say the same things are the right things but they don't believe they're honest i think that the honesty and being forthcoming with who you are and what you stand for even in the face of opposition there was i did a, a candidate forum a couple months ago before the end of the campaign um in march i, I did a candidate forum at a for a conservative talk show radio talk show and the entire audience were people in trump hats literally the like blue trump hats with the flags and the maga hats and all that stuff and my opening line was my name is steve cox i'm an independent um and i'm not a trump supporter and i got booed like the whole place all of them boo and by the end of that thing i had them nodding their heads because they knew i was telling them the truth i didn't chat i didn't i didn't shy away from the booze i took it i knew that they weren't going to like it but i gave it to them anyway and by the end they, they respected me you know and i think that that's that's really what it comes down to you need people that have principles who are going to stand up and they're going to fight mm -hmm. and and if you present that to enough people i believe you don't need all that money to win in those offices to get back to Citizens United. I don't think you need the money. I think you need the money if you're a shit bag and nobody likes you. That's when you need the money. Huh. But if you actually are just a good person, you, I don't think it costs nearly as much. Gee, you know, maybe Jenks should take that advice because at least what you're saying, he would say, but no, the Democrats are, are just as good and it's third parties that ruin everything, even though he lost horribly during his election or during that primary. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah. so there we go. Sorry, folks, I could be a little petty because, again, those tweets about oh, third I'm parties was, was, was <laughs> annoying as hell. But now I think it's important yeah. to really bring up some issues that, you know, you're going to have to probably deal with during your 2020, uh, 2022 run, to be more precise. Yeah. Um, in, yeah. And look, we're dealing with an economic depression, the likes of which we've never seen. Climate change yep. is, a, is the inevitable real threat to, to humanity. Yep. We still got this risk of COVID-19. There's no cure, no vaccination. And we right. are dealing with right now the inevitable true pushback towards police brutality and a government and governments within the state or federal level that are still choosing to basically turn a blind eye to it. So first, I want to talk to you about your your, your initial uh, thoughts on this economic depression that we are in. Um, one, how do we really get out of this? Is a UBI mess? What's your thoughts on UBI? Do we Should we do a Federal Jobs Guarantee Act? How, because right now we, we are looking at the potentially, uh, potential uh, scenario of the old world that we once knew of how jobs and how we did things forever gone. We're looking at massive unemployment. What is the real solution? Because Congress's only real thought, the Democrats and Republicans, was to bail out the top 1% and major corporations. Yeah, that, well, that's who they work for, isn't it? Yeah. Um, it, it, you know, if they worked for us, things would be working a lot differently uh, during this pandemic already. And it, and it may have hit us a lot less hard. You know, uh, there's a lot of stuff that would be different, but they don't work for us. So, like, that's the first reality. People have to understand that, you know, uh, people are going to work. I mean, literally do the work for the people they work for. Like, that's that's how it works. And so the people in Congress are no different than anybody else. You know, you, you're getting your, your payment. Your money is coming from, uh, you know, Raytheon and Exxon Mobil or whatever. Then guess what? Uh, you're going to make sure that those people are taken care of, those, those, those corporations are taken care of. But to answer your question, um, what I believe is actually going on, uh, it might sound a little out there, but I, I really do believe it, is, you know, there's been a couple bills in the House, Democrats, that, Democrats in the House have written for a $2,000 a month UBI. I think one of them had a $500 a month child benefit. The other one was 1000 But they're both UBIs. Um, and I think that's the right move because then the people who are necessary employees who still have to work, they just get more money. So they still get rewarded. Um, unlike this, uh, $600 a week thing, which is, you know, good, but it, you know, there are people who aren't working who are making more money than people who are necessary workers at grocery stores, all this other stuff. I don't think that that's necessarily fair. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think the UBI is a better bet, but the reason why it won't, it won't actually go through, um, unless something drastically changes is because Nancy Pelosi, I believe, knows that uh, the Republican-controlled con or Senate would actually pass it. If it passes the House, I believe that they would send it to the president, and the mm -hmm. president would sign it. And if the president signed it, it would be so popular that he would win in November in a landslide. And if he won in a landslide, it's so, you know, so the point is, is, is I believe Nancy Pelosi and the Democratic Party are suppressing those bills in the House to basically make us suffer more so that they can beat Donald Trump. I think that's what's actually happening. 
So, um, of course, I'm kind of getting a, a sign from my team that we are going to have to be wrapping things up. But before we do, yeah, I uh, so, so no, no, that's perfectly fine. It's great that you're yeah. elaborating. So uh, just uh, two lightning questions, a simple yes or no. Yes. Uh, just, just really getting your just comments on this. Uh, number one, uh, climate change. Is it a threat? Yes or no? The biggest threat we have. All right. Awesome. And then in regards to the, the crisis of COVID-19, is this now a call for Medicare for all in this country? Yes or no? Yes, absolutely. All right. Uh, now, we already did, but yes. All right. So fa- fantastic. But then real quick, uh, and this is something that I really want you to cover on. You can elaborate on this, but uh, we are seeing police brutality. We saw the horrible yes. murder of George Floyd. And there's pro- million, it, there's countless thousands of other individuals like George Floyd who have passed away, who as videos are not seen. But on social media, on Twitter, you did a long Twitter thread about yeah, what's happening. Uh, could you care to elaborate really what, what are basically is going to be happening down the long run, for, at least from your perspective in regards to yes. police brutality in this country? Yeah, this is a thing that I've been, I've been passionate about for a really long time, just because um, I'm the type of person who uh, injustice hits me kind of especially hard. I, I, it bothers me a lot more than it bothers a lot of other people, I think, just naturally. And it always has since I was a little kid. So um, the police brutality thing, all that stuff uh, is, a big, is a big problem. And so in the tweet thread, what I broke down essentially was how many people are killed by police, which um, is a minimum of about 1,200, 1,200 people per year um, and 1,900 or so uh, per year total, including like accidents and suicides while in custody, stuff like that. But the 1,200 is a homicide where the, the mm-hmm. police officer actually kills a civilian. It's 100 a month. Uh, most countries don't have that in a decade, um, you know, in, in our class of uh, rich countries or whatever. They, they, they have maybe one or two a year. And um, right. I think that's already a, a big problem. But the bigger problem is that they avoid accountability. They always avoid accountability, almost always. Statistically, it might as well be always. Um, because uh, I proved in a thread in, in between 2000 and I think it was five and 2016, uh, bo- more than likely an approximate 14,400 people died um, from this, uh, from police brutality in this country, or from, by police in this country. And we've had, it, during that same period of time, 77 cops were actually brought to trial, 77, and only 26 were convicted, um, uh, which is a conviction rate of about, I don't know, 33% or something, where our overall conviction rate in the country is 93%. So, um, you know, it seems like somebody's not trying that hard. And, uh, you know, and it was 77 people is, is a 0.05% of the total deaths there were. So um, uh, it's, a, it's a ridiculous number. But the reason there are three tactics, and this is what I want people to understand, there's three tactics that they use to keep um, even the, car, the, char, the officers that do the wrong thing to keep them from facing accountability. The first one is, and it's the one that gets used most often, is the grand jury trial. They, have, they hold a grand jury trial. Um, which is normally just like, hey, here's the, here's the evidence. Can we try this person? And the grand jury goes, yes, that's enough. And then they try the person. So it's not an actual trial, right? So there's no defense or anything like that. But like in the case of Mike Brown and Ferguson, Darren Wilson, who killed him, murdered him, um, that guy, uh, the prosecutor presented multiple witnesses that he knew weren't there. He knew weren't there. And he admitted it later. Like, it was no big deal. He's like, yeah, I, I knew it, whatever. Um, including the one witness that said that Mike Brown lowered his head and charged it at the cop, and that's why the cop killed him. That was not a person who was even there. So, um, you know, they do that because the DA can then act as a defense at a grand jury and then present it to the public like, oh, we tried. Sorry. And then um, the other two, uh, the other big one that's going around now is that they charge people with the wrong crimes. They actually charge them with the wrong crimes that doesn't fit what they did, and that's what they're doing right now. With this guy, they, they, they're charging him with third-degree murder, which under, under Minnesota law says that it has to be an unintentional act, and it has to not be focused. It has to not be focused on a single person. It has to. So it's, the example would be like if you were drunk driving and you accidentally drove into a bus stop full of people and somebody died, you could be charged with third-degree murder because you were negligent and and you weren't focused on trying to kill any particular person. So they're charging him with too light of a crime. Because that, it, by the definition of that crime, he will be acquitted. That's what's going on. Yeah. And that's what always goes on. It's these types of tactics. And there's a, it's my pinned tweet thread on Twitter, but this is how they, they prevent them from, from facing accountability. And if we don't have police that are accountable to us, we don't need them, in my opinion. 
That's a very powerful note, and I do urge all our viewers and subscribers to see your Twitter thread. I think it's important. I mean, it's one thing for us to talk about, but I think it's important for all of us to see it as well. And speaking of which, look, you already said that you think you are going to be running in 2022 as an independent in California's yep. 39th Congressional District for, again, the midterm election cycle of 2022. So then for our viewers and subscribers, if they want to learn more about you, find you online and social media and maybe help out your future campaign, uh, where can they go to find you? Well, uh, the my, my website is voteforcox.com. Um, it's, I'll be rebuilding it soon. Like my, my bio is old. It says that I'm uh, I'm a, you know, my wife and I don't have kids, but we have a child now. <laughs> Congratulations. We have a baby. Thank you. Congratulations. Uh, Daphne, she's, the, she's, she's my entire world. And, um, and then, uh, you know, my, my, every, all my social media from Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, those are the three that I have are all real Steve Cox. So it's facebook.com slash real Steve Cox or, or at real Steve Cox on Twitter or Instagram. Um, you know, I, I can be kind of an asshole and a snarky person and, and whatever, but uh, uh, it's just because I'm just as angry as everybody else is, and and I have a very short fuse for bullshit. You know, I I, I can't deal with it very well, and I'm I can kind of really tired of it. <laughs> yeah. So so sometimes I might come across a little harsh, but uh, I, I you know I hope people understand that I really do care, and I'm trying to do the right things and trying to actually uh, right the ship, if you will. All right, well, then let's kick this revolution Thanks. into overdrive, and I'm definitely looking forward to doing a follow-up interview uh, interview with you uh, in 2022 when you're uh, doing your uh, during the midterm election cycle because I think now more than ever we should truly have a parliamentary system. We should get money out of politics and address all the other issues that our two-party system uh, fails to address. And to anyone in corporate media or even online progressive media, <coughs> Jenk, uh, once uh, has a problem with it, well, then, hey, it's, it's going to happen because we're going to break this two-party system. So Steve Cox, thank you so much That's for right. joining Hard Lens Media, and we were looking forward to having you back on. And then real quick, too, uh, I want to give a special shout out to a super chat, Cassie Lloyd, $50. My goodness. Thank you so much for all you do. Much love from Michigan. And thank you so much, Cassie Lloyd. Thank you so much to our Patreon supporters. Uh, thank you all of you for tuning in. This is Kit Cabell with Hard Lens Media. Peace to you guys. Let us all do we can to build a better future.